We are starting Luke chapter 5 tonight. And uh, let me turn there, yeah. Got it. And I'll go ahead and read this first bit. <clears throat> I've titled this, The Power of Teaching. So I'll begin with chapter 5, verses 1 through 16. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 16, and I'll read. One day, as Yeshua was standing on the shore of Lake Kinneret, and that's the Sea of Galilee, it is a large lake, and it has actually a number of names. Kinneret is one of them. Uh, but one day, as Yeshua was standing on the shore of Lake Kinneret, with the people pressing in around him in order to hear the word of God, he noticed two boats pulled up on the beach, left there by the fishermen who were cleaning their nets. He got into one of the boats, and the one belonging to Shimon, that's Simon, and asked him to put, a, put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Shimon, put out into deeper water and let down your nets for a catch. Shimon answered, we've worked hard all night long, Rabbi and haven't caught a thing. But if you say so, well, let down the nets. They did this and took in so many fish that their nets began to tear. So they motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats to the point of sinking. When he saw this, Shimon Kepha, that's Simon Peter, <clears throat> fell at Yeshua's knees and said, get away from me, sir, because I am a sinner. One of the more lovable passages I read. For astonishment has, had seized him and everyone with him at the catch of fish that they had taken. And likewise, both Yaakov and Yochanan, that's James and John, Shimon's partners. Don't be afraid or don't be frightened, Yeshua said to Shimon. From now on, you will be catching men alive, which is a good thing. And as soon as they had beach, beached their boats, they left everything behind and followed him. Once, when Yeshua was in one of the towns, there came a man completely covered with zara'at, that's uh, leprosy, not so much as we might think of it today, Hansen's disease, sort of. On seeing Yeshua, he fell on his face and begged him, Sir, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Yeshua reached out his hand and touched him, saying, I'm willing, be cleansed. Immediately the Tzara'at left him. Then Yeshua warned him not to tell anyone. Quote, instead, as a testimony to the people, go to the Kohen, go to the high priest, and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moshe commanded, end of quote. But the news about Yeshua kept spreading all the more so that huge crowds would gather to listen and be healed of their sickness. However, he made a practice of withdrawing to remote places in order to pray. So I'll ask if, if there's any thoughts on what I just read. I read actually what we would probably read for two sermons, but uh, any thoughts that you might have are most certainly welcomed. Again, I learned from you. It makes me wonder. I mean, I, I like, like, I love Simon Peter's reaction to Jesus mm -hmm. in both instances. He just walks up and says, "Hey, we let's go fishing." Yeah. <laughs> and, and Simon and Peter's like, "We've been fishing all night. And ain't nothing good. We, we're not maybe who you want to go fishing with, but all right." Mm -hmm. So you know, he he has some natural doubts. But he doesn't really hesitate. Mm -hmm. You know, here's a total stranger coming up. He doesn't. Right. What is it that he saw in Jesus now, understanding that Simon Peter here is probably like a teenager, mm -hmm. not, not a full, what we would consider a full grown adult, but probably like a 16 or something like that. Yeah. Well, and later on speaks of his mother in law, so he might be a little older. Yeah. But young. Yeah. But of course, back then it was very common to get married young, too. Sure. <clears throat> but point being, 
he responded. Why did he respond? He just and maybe that's why I wasn't a good fisherman is because he just kind of believed. Oh yeah, they're biting over there or whatever. I don't know. But then as soon as they get this enormous success, the first thing he does is, oh, I, you know, go away. I'm a sinner. I'm you know mm. your way. You know that he understands something's different about this guy mm. standing in front of him. And he hasn't known from any other stranger that's on the beach. Mm -hmm. And yet he responds immediately in both cases in a humble spirit. And, you know, he's just, for whatever reason, you know, and I guess that's why in part, you know, something that Jesus saw in him, he didn't just pick anybody. There were probably other people with their boats on the shore at that point too. Sure. He could have chosen. Sure. But he knew something was special about these young men, mm -hmm. not just Peter, but the other guys and the other boats that were fishing with him. And uh, he singled them out and he said, okay, well, if you think this is something, just wait to what you see, you know, what, what you're going to learn how to do next. Right. And I, I guarantee you, he had no idea he was going to be on this three-year journey and see all of these things that he was going to see. Yeah. And then at the end of that, fast forward three years and then Peter denies him three times. Mm -hmm. He's like, what happened to this young Peter that, that said, all right, hop in the boat, let's go. Mm -hmm. And then get away from me, I'm a sinner. Mm -hmm. you know? And then now he's going to say, no, I don't know this guy. Mm -hmm. Three times. Yeah. He gets mad about the fact. So it's, it's interesting character sketch here, what's going on. Yeah. And what was it about Jesus that was so different? Mm -hmm. And we wouldn't figure that out. Can we reflect that kind of thing? We were just to walk up to somebody and say, hey, you know, I want to introduce you to this guy that changed my life. And they're going to say, all right, let's do it. You know, mm -hmm. let's, let's say, well, you got something different. Right. Something right. about you. I, I just, I know that you're not pulling the wool over my eyes. Right. What yeah. was that? Yeah, it's... If we can reflect him through us, yeah, I hear what you're saying very well, loud and clear, because that's something that I truly believe in as well. Tal, did you have something you wanted to add in? No, not really. No? Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I want to throw on a towel. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'll, um, I'll go ahead and read my note. It's somewhat lengthy. I apologize. But um, see what my thoughts are on this. I have chosen to take in as much as these couple stories all under one heading. As I said before, there's a, you could, if you were going to preach a, a, a topical sermon as I did when the first year we came here, you could you could preach two or three or four from this, but I just thought I'd take it all in in 16 verses. Um, when presenting Torah with avenues of internet, I would commonly say, quote, truth is like good morning coffee. It will take a lot out of you. But um, <laughs> sometimes I use the word Torah in place of truth for Torah means teaching. And, uh, you know, Psalm 119, verse 142 says, Your Torah is truth. And uh, so the teaching from the Word made flesh himself is powerful. He is, you know, Torah is, is personified. And even in Deuteronomy, it says, it says of um, God, He is your life. And then it says of Torah, literally translated, He is your life. So Yeshua is that Word, that Torah, made flesh. Here, as folks listen to the word of Hashem, listen to the word of God, of Yodevave, they pressed in all the more in order to hear, for the crowd was growing in number, so it appears. Noticing a couple boats having been pulled ashore, Yeshua got into the particular boat owned by a fellow named Shimon and asked Mr. Shimon to put the boat a distance into the water once again. Thus, he could better broadcast his voice for the sake of the teaching being received. 
Specifically, what Yeshua had been teaching about is more or less impossible to know, but he told Shimon to launch the boat into deeper water still yet for the sake of catching some fish. As we know, Shimon objected, having just cleaned his nets and called it a day, or a night actually, as it were. It is within this objection that Shimon refers to Yeshua as rabbi. Interestingly enough, the stranger he calls rabbi. The Greek word is epistastis, literally means one who stands over, but is translated in many ways. Rabbi fits well enough with the understanding of how we use the term pastor or shepherd. Pastor, a nice, what is it, Spanish or Latin word? Probably, probably meaning probably shepherd. Latin. I think it's Latin. But what, appear, what happens next is what changes everything with Shimon. Yeshua is no longer seen as a mere rabbi, but he's not seen merely as a rabbi anymore, great or small. For Shimon, as well as the rest, Yeshua is seen as Yode Vave. He is seen as, in Greek, Kyrios covers the, what we otherwise call the Tetragrammaton, the, the name of God. The Greek word here is Kyrie, which is taken directly from Kyrios. The only response Shimon has now is to fall or worship at Yeshua's feet with the words, get away from me, sir, because I am a sinner. End of quote. And I compare this with Genesis 18, 27, Job 42, Isaiah 6, 5, where, you know, these men experience God himself. You know, the Bible will speak of things happening by the finger of God, which is a an old idiom for the wonderful, you know, outstanding things that God can do merely with his finger. But you think of Isaiah, last reference I put here, Isaiah 6, 5, where Isaiah says, I am I am undone, for I have seen the Lord, you know. And in all of these cases, you know, Job, you know, falls at his feet. So there's, this is the same place that Peter is in now. He's at that place where he sees something even deeper. And he's, oh no, no, I'm I'm just, you know, a sinner, i.e. a common guy that goes out fishing, you know, as a living, and I, I'm just, I'm a piece of dirt. You know, all of a sudden, before this person that he now understands even better from one incident, he sees himself for who he really is in by comparison. This perspective was shared by Yaakov and Yochanan, James and John as well. The scene has, has long struck me, has long struck Mr. Ron, as it is easy for me to consider myself in that place with a rather similar reaction. When I am able to finally stand before him, I will still yet fall at his feet in worship. The whole scene changes Shimon, it changes Simon. Yeshua simply declares the facts as they are. Don't be frightened. From now on, you will be catching men. You will be, you're, you're going to go, you think this is something, as Brian pointed out. You're going to go from catching mere fish to fishing for people. You will influence mankind, in other words. So... It still seems like it could get misinterpreted, but... Yeah, I, I'm sure it can get... You know, idiomatic stuff can get misinterpreted, of course. Yeah, I don't know how far it's like. It's like, don't worry, you won't be, don't, you won't be catching fish anymore. You'll be catching people. It's like, I, I am just mad. It's like, it, um, I, I'd certainly be confused for. <laughs> sure. And that's why we call them idioms, because they're, they're sing, they're the language of a particular people. You know. So, I mean, if he, if he understood it, then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. So instead of filet of fish, we're going to man. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to need a bigger fishing rod. Man, taco? No, wait, that didn't sound good. Never mind. I was thinking fish taco, okay? <laughs> Never mind. So, this, this whole scene here, uh, 
think it's worse than more. Like yeah, we're, we're going to move on. <laughs> this whole scene right here, on. really, this is okay. moving into the queue for, you know, leaving everything behind to follow this man, to follow the one that he now knows, even from one experience. It's more than the, the, the miracle that happened. It's something, as Brian pointed out, that he saw in Jesus, in Yeshua. He now knows, and this is what's fascinating about Peter. He seems to understand this quickly. So he's going to drop everything and follow him. Not terribly unlike a fellow that we know as Avraham or Abraham, who also, God says, leave your family, leave your kindred, leave everything you know. Go to a land that I haven't shown you yet, but I'm going to show you. He said, okay. So responses like that are, you know, something that I can tip my hat to. Hmm. The Lord, as the Torah or teaching made flesh, changes anyone who truly encounters him. May not change us as much dramatically and quickly as, say, Simon Peter, but he does change us. And that's also what Brian was saying earlier, you know, that when we become fishers of men, when we become influencers of men, and i.e. mankind, that that happens not just simply because we say, hey, you want to be saved? You know, saved from what? Saved how? Say, well, what do you mean? You know, it, it happens when they can see something in us that for one, is different. For another, that they can begin to trust enough to hear us out. And that has to be the Holy Spirit flowing through us. We, in and of myself, and I can tell you plenty of times when it was just me talking, okay? In and of myself, I am not going to influence somebody beyond, say, somebody saying, leave me alone, Ron. But with the Holy Spirit flowing through me, I can influence people for God's glory and Simon Peter will do the same and it begins with this experience <clears throat> so any other thoughts about that I haven't read all of my notes here but I feel like that's a stopping place to ask you any other thoughts you might have I keep accidentally jumping on the video oh. sorry I have no thoughts. Okay. All right. Except you should say hi to the rest of the the regulars. Yeah. Because they're all on your show. <coughs> well, hi, regulars. <laughs> we, for those of you who Trace are not... Trace cracking jokes. Yeah. For, for those of you who are not usually with us on Friday night here, we, we're mm, probably about 60% of what we usually are, something like that. <laughs> but anyway... Um, Hi, y'all. The rest were killed off by the virus. <laughs> yeah, we killed them off. Yeah. Tacos. So my final note, my final thought here in notes is, as for teachers and anyone who would bear the weight of the stake, it becomes necessary to, quote, withdraw to remote places in order to pray, end of quote. That's the last line in this bit. As I said last week, you know, when, when you... Now, Becky and I have taken up something of a pastoral position, and that means that we, that, that beam that we carry gets heavier. But even if you are just seeking to, you know, have a little influence where you work or where you go about, you will feel the weight of the beam. You will feel the weight of the stake. And yes, for whatever it's worth, the Greek word translated cross does mean a stake or a upright pole, I say beam sometimes, but you'll feel that weight, and so it is good to take that time and let the, let the Lord bring out the better you, as I said last week. And we, I think it's interesting that Luke points this out a little bit, a little bit more often than even the other Gospels that we have read so far. Hmm. <laughs> okay, Tal. You know I I like to pick on Tal. I trust Tal. 
You sure you don't just go left or right? No, I... <laughs> Trey says hi. Hi, Trey. I trust Tal, and that Tal, take that as a big compliment, please. <laughs> no. I, I, after all the experiences that my wife and I have had, I don't necessarily just right away trust people, but I trust this young man. <laughs> and that's your first mistake. You've known him almost his whole life. You pretty much. Almost. <laughs> almost. <laughs> for the first nine months, you didn't have eyes on it. And even then, I, you know, had little yeah. things. With... <clears throat> I mean, there, that was a phase, you know. <laughs> for there for nine months, he was a man trapped in a woman's body. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's true. Yeah. <laughs> How scary! Say, I knew him. Definitely, but not in that way. <laughs> A phase that many men are going through nowadays. <laughs> okay, Trey's complaining that I'm not reading the other note to you. Oh. So, Trey says, I see that you're still great at disparaging yourself while teaching. <laughs> so apparently you were dissing yourself. Uh, I, I there, mean, Trey, I told him. Trey, I'm trying to be very honest, and I don't mean... <laughs> trying to degrade myself to be popular or something, you know, is that is off I actually a, a matter that sometimes we do. Oh, well, I'm this and this and this so that we can gain popularity by demeaning ourselves. It's called fishing for compliments. Yes, fishing for compliments. <laughs> no, I'm, uh, there you go. I'm actually trying, I mean, I, I have yes. experienced myself, I'm 55 years old and I have experienced myself plenty of times. I've had the wind blow, you know, I'm, I've stood downwind for myself plenty of times, and I, I know what I'm like. I don't have to make any pretense. Trey thinks you're perfect. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Trey does think you're perfect. Uh, he's, he's seen probably some bad sides, me too. All right, so tell. Uh, mm. If I'm, I would, mm. I would like to trust you. Yes. Talk louder. Okay. I'm trying to tell if, uh, <laughs> if I could uh, trust sure you no. uh, trust you to read Luke chapter 5, verse 17 through 26. That was from 26. Gigi, by the way. Okay. Oh. I, one day we will f fix up a microphone system. Mm -hmm. Luke 5, 17 through 26, another batch. Sorry, you were saying, you know, I trust you to read this. Like, oh, so I should read Luke 6 or something. <laughs> <laughs> read the wrong thing. All right. I'll be nice. Mm -hmm. That's why I can trust you. <laughs> <laughs> On one of those days, as he was teaching, the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed. And they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles in the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, why do you question in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been laying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized from them all, and they glorified God, and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. Okay, thank you. Now this is where I call this the a paradoxical day. This is where we find the breaking point with Pharisees and Torah teachers, or i.e. scribes. Now the Sadducees, the Tzadukim, descended from Zadok, they had gone astray years before when Antiochus threw most of them into the desert. But, uh, and they probably went astray, you know, for fairly, you know, understandable reasons. But the only thing that Jesus says to them is, you don't know the book, you don't know the Bible, nor do you know God himself. 
Pharisees, he said to them, you're in danger of hell. In so many words, Jesus said to the Sadducees, you're going to hell. And here is where for the Pharisees, we find the breaking point. We will hear most everything you say. We follow, your, we follow you around here in your teaching. But when you, when you begin to put divinity upon yourself, when you begin to say your God in so many ways or so many words, that's where we find the breaking point. And that is still yet to this day, much the breaking point. But, uh, so I call it a paradox. Anyone have, before I go into my bit here, anyone have anything they want to add in? I don't mind. Wait, let me see if anybody else does. Hmm. No, Michelle just says you're humble. <laughs> There's serious lag time. <laughs> yeah. Between conversations and responses, but yeah. Okay, that's it. All right. You're saying Michelle still. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, did you hear that? Brian said you're slow. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Uh, it's like, uh, it's like, yeah. It's like, boy, how's the under song of that bus looking, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's my little bit. So I'm trying to move along here. Don't get anyone in trouble. Well, that thumping you hear is me. Oh, yes. In this story, Maddie and Mark, you know, Matthew and Mark, briefly mentioned the presence of, quote-unquote, scribes, or as Dr. Stern puts it, Torah teachers. Here in the, the AV, the, uh, the uh, authorized version, or the King James Version, also has doctors of the law, which is what Tal was reading. So... Luke mentions the doctor meaning teacher at this point, but Luke mentions the presence of both scribes and Pirishim or Pharisees, which need not go together, though they quite often do, quite often did, for both are Torah teachers. Pharisee, the word Pharisee, first I read it first in Nehemiah chapter 8, where it says they explained. This what began what's called the Great Knesset. They explained the word, the word there is parush. They explained the Torah so that people could understand it. That's what Pharisee means one who explains, one who parses the word of truth, as Paul said to Timothy uh, rightly divide or rightly parse the word of truth. He is making Timothy a Pharisee. Not Pharisee in the way we think, but mm -hmm. one who. Okay, that's what I'm doing. I'm seeking to explain this. There, by definition, I'm being a Pharisee. So, uh, the house spoken of here is likely the house of Shimon, or Kepha, Cephas, Peter, as most of us agree. Uh, most everybody who comments on this and speaking about whose house they're in is probably Peter's house. Pete and Andy's house, Andrew's house, got a hole poked into, in, poked into it as some friends carrying a paralyzed fellow came through the roof for the man's healing. The level of trust here, trust that neither Pete nor Yeshua was going to bark at these fellows for the interruption, grabbed Yeshua's attention as well as admiration. And you think about it. I mean, if somebody all of a sudden, you know, tried to get in here by going through the roof, of course, this is not the same kind of roof as back mm -hmm. then. It but also still. said through the tiles, specifically. Yeah. You, you know, at least most of the pictures, you see more like thatch roof or whatever, for mm -hmm. whatever reason. Yeah. It, yes, ma'am. Michelle wants to know if Jesus was a Pharisee. Many scholars today note that he teaches much of the same teachings that the Pharisees taught. If you read Talmud and so forth, there are great comparisons. And so many will say he, he really taught as a Pharisee. And the only, that's why the Pharisees followed him around. They found, found some commonality. The, as I said, the only thing that they really began to back away from, and the one thing that really triggered their distrust was him claiming well, claiming to be the I am. So, yes. Uh, and in terms of 
the way he explained, by definition again, he was a Pharisee. Paul was as well. Paul, Paul said of himself, he lived and died a Pharisee. Pharisee of Pharisees. Yeah, Pharisee of Pharisees was Paul, by his own definition. So, and that's Paul's way of saying, hey, I, I always went by Torah. In fact, I never went against the teachings of the fathers, he said, i.e., I never went against halakha, or works of the law, as the scenes would put it. So, um, so I find, I find a level of trust here, uh, of, you know, he, I think if I were in that place, I'd say, wait, why are you interrupting, you know, or something like that. I don't know. Maybe I wouldn't. But Yeshua just, he kind of flows with it and, in fact, attends to the situation. So, uh, to go on man here is Anthropos. Uh, let me read it from uh, this translation. Uh, Yeah, um, yeah. He said, David Stern has friend. Your sins are forgiven. Uh, many translations will will have man. Your sins are forgiven, and the word is anthropos, which does not speak of either male or female or nationality, much like the Hebrew word Adam. Adam means mankind. This may be why Doctor Stern uses the word friend, as Yeshua says, "Your sins are forgiven." But yeah. Yeah, get rid of the. Uh... Yeah, gender specificity there. Right, he's they just anthropos, human. Right, yeah, he's basically saying, "Hey, fellow human," you know. Mm -hmm. He's kind of putting him in a lot of ways. He's kind of putting him on, you know, putting himself on the level of this fellow. Yeah, I suppose you could look at it as, you know, well, I guess it's the difference between, you know, fellow human and you know, human, neurotic, right. weak human. <laughs> yeah, oh, I suppose really? you could. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like it could be, you know, depending on the. You know, it, it, you know, it doesn't really you know, give any extra information to tell you whether he's, you know, saying, you know, look, mm -hmm. talking about it as on equal ground or mm -hmm. down. That's true. Down to him, but. I think the, the you know, 80% of my thought here is kind of agreeing with Dr. Stern and saying friend, mm -hmm. you know, kind of saying, hey, you know, uh, you know, I know you just broke into the house from the roof and all that, but hey, you know, mm -hmm. It's all right, your sins are forgiven. That's mm. probably what it is. But, you know, yeah. Uh, I don't mind, uh, I, in fact, I like different opinions because I like the discussion. But. So he, he looks at him and says, your sins are forgiven. Just, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that, you know, it makes me want to stop and just preach salvation here. Mm -hmm. what, what is it? Because he really received this fellow and, and extended, knew what he needed. You know, he wasn't coming down the roof merely because he was paralyzed. He he needed also forgiveness. He needed reception. So, and he knew that this man was coming to him in some somewhat of a desperate way. So we know the story. Which is easier to say? An interesting thought is simply this: in stories such as this one, sins are equated with infirmities as if sin brings about it brings about or itself sickness just as sophronio is sanity my computer does not like this word to be un, uncapitalized it will always want to capitalize it because that's a greek word that means every, you know anybody who is in this i wouldn't doubt brian is familiar with this word as sanity but it's translated as sober-minded and so forth. So also sin is seen as a sickness of the mind and or body or that which affects the body or soul in such a way. So in, in the Bible often you'll see this where sin, and we certainly know this from the fellow that was, you know, hanging around graves with, you know, a legion of demons within and his sin was causing him to be insane. It's causing him to be not sophrenio. But this is the matter that the Bible presents. Sin will ultimately, ultimately either show a lack of mental 
health or it will bring about mental and instability. Or physical. Or physical, yes. And, and it seems like, you know, it seems like half or most of the time that, you know, there's somebody particularly sinful that's accompanied by an illness of some form or another. Remember, sin is not merely what we would call, you know, we, for centuries, we've looked at morality as what you, you know, what, what you don't do. Sin is not merely something that, you know, I don't know what we think of sin. Now, does sin means, remember, to miss the mark, to fall short. <clears throat> In other words, sin is something of, of a weakness. It comes upon you as a weakness. Well, what is sickness? Sickness is your, your, your health, your... Uh, uh, lost the word right now. Um, yeah, you... There is parts of you that have weakened, so that that is why sin is often compared to sickness. Yes, ma'am. Jerry says it almost seems like sin is something that causes you to not be perfect. Right. Yeah. Sin. Sin is that which f causes you to fall short. You miss that mark. And Romans chapter nine will say that Yeshua is the goal, telios, translated in once upon a time, in meant goal, you know, to this end, do this. But now we know it is something different, termination, but Yeshua, Jesus, is the goal of the Torah for all of those who are being saved. And so sin is missing the mark the Torah shoots for. Jesus living a sinless life is the goal. In other words, he shows us how to hit that mark rather than fall short. And we do so in him. So sin is when you you just can't seem to make it. You know. Well, that means sin is in the air, so how are you saved? <laughs> you know. If you're breathing it in, right? His name is salvation. If you wanted a translation of our Lord's name in English, it's salvation. So let me read on. Uh, second, the more common New Testament word for forgiveness, afemi, means to send away. So which is easier, to say your sins are sent away or get up and walk? Yeshua then speaks of the Son of Man having power, yes, on earth, to forgive sins, but tells the dude, quote, get up, pick up your mattress, and go home. Which is easier, you know? Are not the two matters one and the same thing, you know? Your sins are sent away or get up and walk, that's the same stuff. Yes, ma'am. Jewel says nothing is perfect without God. Right. Amen, amen. Good job, Jewel. <laughs> Nothing meets the goal without him. So really to send away sin and to pick up your bed and walk are really one and the same. If your sins are gone, if your sickness is gone, you are now able to pick up your bed and go home. And that's really Yeshua's point when he says, which is easier? He's kind of saying, hey, man, it's the same thing, you know. Let me finish this job here. <laughs> so, for the man, the man needed to receive forgiveness. He needed to receive this, the, the letting go of his sins before he could really have a capacity within his mind or body to stand up. He couldn't have stood up and picked up his bed and went home had he not been had the capacity within himself to receive that forgiveness to to receive that sending away of that weakness that weakness couldn't go away unless he could receive that had the capacity within himself to receive it how many times have i not received forgiveness from somebody 
because I didn't have the capacity within myself to do so. I wasn't ready, so to speak. Any thoughts therein? Hmm? I, mean, I, I hear Trey and Michelle and Jill making some good points. Um, Are you telling us to step up? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I may say her name wrong, but mm -hmm. it's Jeannie, mm -hmm. J-E-N-E-E. -E. Um, <clears throat> Michelle just welcomed her, and then she just responded, Welcome, family. I'm so excited to be a part of mm -hmm. your fellowship. Michelle, thanks, my friend. So, i thought I'd read that for you. Okay. You guys can say hi to her. Hi. Hi, Jeannie. I hope, Hi. Yes. I hope you're <laughs> saying your name right. Welcome. But yes. Yep. Welcome to the group. We love you. Um, so yes. I, and within these notes, I'm basically trying to, you know, maybe in a backhanded way, remind you of what salvation is. So, and it's interesting, he said, get up and walk. You know, it, it's when you have received the forgiveness of God, he then tells you, that's what he tells us, you know. He tells the woman, uh, I can't remember the situation precisely right at this moment, but he says, get up and go and sin no more. You know, so he... Is that the, uh, the adulterer who was about to get stoned? Right. I think. Right. Yeah, you're forgiven... Now go and sin no more. The go and get up and walk, that means, hey, you can do this. You're forgiven, you're cleared, okay? Your sins are gone. Your sins are sent away, i.e. forgiven. Get up and walk. The way you pronounce her name is Janae. Janae, okay. There you go. Thank you, Janae. And she says Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> Forgive you just this once for yeah. <laughs> Shabbat Shalom uh, A peaceful Sabbath and may you be blessed. So, amazement quote amazement seized them all and they made a bracha to God. They they blessed him. They I think the King James puts it as they glorified him. Uh, they were awestruck, saying, "We have seen extraordinary things today." Now, the word extraordinary or strange, I think is some translation. Outside of the ordinary. Pardon? Outside of the ordinary. Outside of the ordinary, yes. Paradoxus. Greek word is paradoxus, meaning contrary to received opinion. Para meaning beside, doxa meaning opinion. Paradoxus might give us the English word paradoxical. That is, this day an event proved to challenge some mere opinions. Which is a good day. Yeah, more than one duck. Yeah. So when you have a day, it was less than three. Yeah. If you can have a day that challenges mere opinions, you know, I think there's a. I want to say this is Latin. I may be wrong, but there's another word for opinion. It's pronounced dogma. But the if you can. Do enough truth that challenges opinions, that alone is a good day. Because truth will always trump mere opinions. Okay. And yes, I'm speaking of capital T truth here. Principal truth. Yes, Tom? Um, you know, I'm not merely talking about that couch is brown. I'm, I'm <laughs> Not talking like merely. Subjective. I'm really not talking merely about fact. I'm talking about what is yeah. brown. Yeah. It's a fading of orange, but anyway. <laughs> As we learn, Wednesday. Yeah. Yes. So, any other thoughts concerning? I might go a bit further. Sure. Okay. You all seem to be happy with it, so. <laughs> We haven't thrown anything at yeah, it. Yeah, I haven't thrown anything at it. Doesn't, this, so. doesn't feel as long as it probably has been. Okay. You, know, you just explained the difference between Satan and and believe. You better believe, or a magician. You know, or you know, uh, you say I took a dabber and you're healed. That doesn't work. You right. have to really believe that the sin has left you. Mm -hmm. 
and then you will be healed from right. what you're about, right? Right, yeah. If I, well, if I go to the doctor and he looks at me and says, you know, okay, you're, you're well now. Congratulations. Well, I can, yeah, I can actually, my mind, the mind is a powerful, powerful thing. I can convince myself in my mind, no, he's, he's, he's trying to trick me here. You know, he's not really telling me the truth. In other words, if I don't have the capacity within myself to really take in what he just told me, then I may be still stumbling. My mind may be tricking the rest of me. Remember the, the nerve that runs through your back comes right down from your head here. In other words, your mind can actually train your body to whatever degree how to feel. So I must have the capacity to receive this. And no, it's not a magic trick. Something that we have to work together with. Yes, ma'am. Trey asked, isn't the truth the ultimate objective fact? Yes. Truth is the ultimate objective fact. And so is truth true? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Is, 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 is truth true? Is, is, uh, same thing. <laughs> that depends on what your definition of is. is. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, and, you, yeah. just, you just went all crazy on it. <laughs> Mr. Postmodern, Mr. <laughs> So, yeah, we're, Don't you speak that evil on me? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, the, uh, if we're going to get off on that, look up the etymology. Why do I speak of etymology so much? Uh oh. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't like that word. Yeah, because you don't like that word. Etmos, truth. Etmos is the Greek word for true. No, 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 that's not it. If I speak of etymology, it's because I'm trying to find words have beginnings words actually have a meaning every word has a meaning regardless of how much you want to change it regardless of how much society in general wants to change a word that word means something regardless of what society thinks about it and that's what etymology seeks to discover such as passion of the christ passion does not mean i'm really driven no passion literally means to suffer and suffer means to allow, <laughs> as in women's allowance, women's suffrage. But see, if all of society takes it to mean something else, who cares? <laughs> a word means something, period. There's a reason I say that. There's a reason I say that, because sooner or later we have, a, we have subjective truth. We don't have objective truth anymore. Sooner or later, anybody can mean anything they want, and you can voice your own morality, you can voice whatever, you know. Well, it's you be you, and that whole, you know, thing. We, we don't have anything objective anymore. So if I point out etymology of something, I have a reason for doing so. Because there are there is this thing called real. <laughs> there is this thing called reality. Michelle okay. had a little blurred one here. Okay, sure. She says, yes, our mind is powerful. Our words are powerful. Very much so. Very much so. Don't think for a moment that you cannot convince yourself of a lie when you mm -hmm. really think it's not a lie. You can convince yourself of most anything. If you run that thought through your mind enough times, you will accept it. But that's why our Lord repeats he said, well, Paul says, capture every thought, make it obedience to, to the Christ, make it obedient to the Christ, capture, we think many thoughts per second, you have to capture those, and capture, recognize what's noble and what's not noble. All right, I'm going to go on a bit further, let me see, let me look at these notes, because I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, drag you guys too much. All right, all right, yeah. I'll, we're going to go through chapter five tonight, which means that I better start working on my studies. <laughs> all right. Your catch up? Yeah, do some catch up. Miss Rebecca. My Eshet Hayu. Okay, fine then. You can't do that. Sure, she I'll, have to, I'll have to jump out of, out of the video. I can't do both at the same time. That's fine. So, okay. Just minimize it. Around. All right. Nobody expect me to pass along that. And for a little bit, okay. my spouse is going to read the Bible. <gasps> and you're going to like it. And you're going to, yes. 
Luke chapter 5, 27 through 38, 11 verses. Or 12, actually. What was the verse? Tell me what the verse was. 27 through 38. Basically, finish it up. Alright. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him, and Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who belonged to their sect, complained to his disciples, quote, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Unquote. Jesus answered them, quote, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Unquote. And they said to him, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. Jesus answered, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears out a piece of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment, and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured... Oh, wait. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. Okay. I have simply titled this bit Levi or Matityahu, the refreshed cloth or refreshed wine. So, <clears throat> most all agree that Levi, Levi is Matthew or Matityahu. And uh, just can't one name. <laughs> I well, I like to give you know both the name as it was then and how it, after it's gone through a couple of thousand years and around the world. And that's not too bad, you know, when it Matijahu and all you know is a little different from Yaakov becoming James. That's quite a stretch there, but anyway. So most all believe that this fellow is Matthew who wrote the gospel called by his name. Levi or Levi may be his birth name and Matijahu gift of, Matijahu means gift of Yah. It may be his nickname or vice versa. But it's worth mentioning that the name Levi also indicates that he was of said tribe. Many would name, many in the tribe of Levi would name their sons Levi. So could be, for we all tend to name our kiddos accordingly. As a tax collector, Levi was most certainly un unliked by most of his brethren, unless his tax collecting job was for the temple wherein he served as a Levi, a Levite, which is far less likely, actually. If he was serving as a Levite within the temple to collect taxes, I don't think he would have been uh, disliked as much. But it is also clear that he had an encounter with Yeshua to the point that he, quote, got up, left everything, and followed, end of quote. He followed the Savior when called to do so. I'm, I'm guessing the encounter to be of such with freedom. He encountered freedom from the stronghold of such a Roman coerced job. I'm, I can sense that he, you can sense, I'm sure, too, that he did not necessarily, he is a job that he had to do not one that he wanted or, you know, that sort of thing. He, he was coerced. Most, tech, most Jewish tax collectors were coerced to do that by Rome. And uh, as well as like Flavius Josephus was coerced to write by Rome. It's not that he himself decided to put the quill to the, to the uh, paper, so to speak. It was Rome who coerced him. And so it was probably with Levi. A banquet in honor of Messiah Yeshua would most certainly be a way for Maddie to say thank you. In fact, he appears to invite members of the crew. 
What has often grabbed me within this story is the word echo, the Greek word echo meaning to hold, with the adverb kakos meaning to be evilly ill. Kakos means to, there's a word that means to be ill in Greek, but this means to be ill because of evil. Quote, the one who needs, the, the ones who need a doctor aren't the healthy, but the ones being held by evil would be a way of translating. These would be the ones who merely assume that they are righteous or right, and I have become so often convinced that righteousness or rightness, if you, you know, I've been convinced about this, you know, if you don't really care for so many vowels, I'll just call it rightness. But it has to do with the mind. And quite often we find that it has to do with the mind, i.e., you know, sanity. Being challenged again at this honorable banquet, this time about fasting and praying, davening, as Stern would put it, Yeshua responds by noting his presence as the bridegroom. And you can go to Exodus chapter 19 where God says, you know, if you, if you will follow my ways, follow my covenant, then you will be to me a segula, a special treasure, i.e. my bride, my wife. Yes, we have fasted and most certainly davened since our groom went to prepare a place for us, but we do not need to note the instructional words of Isaiah 58, 1 through 12, specifically 6 through 7, for a fuller definition of fasting. And in that particular bit, if I can stop here, well, I'll just read it. Quote, here is the sort of fast I want, releasing those unjustly bound, Untying the thongs of the yoke, letting the oppressed go free, breaking every yoke, sharing your food with the hungry, taking the homeless poor into your house, clothing the naked when you see them, fulfilling your duty to your kinsmen. And when, when we speak of fasting, and when we've been fasting, like he said, we would do since he left and he will return. But I thought I would add that in. You have, you have food because you're not eating? Share that with somebody who's hungry. You have clothing because you're denying clothing? Maybe that's the way you're fasting? Share your clothes with somebody who doesn't have them. Share your toilet paper? Share your toilet paper with somebody who doesn't have them. Rappel Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's, that's basically what that's saying. If you're fasting from this, share that thing that you're fasting from with somebody who actually is short <laughs> Fasting from toilet paper, so that's leaving streaks in your hair. Yeah. So, anyway. Or making your dogs. <laughs> or making your dogs. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll read this and then we'll be quiet. We talked about this when encountering this passage in Maddie's version. Judaism and Messianic faith must adapt to one another. Judaism and Messianic faith, i.e. Christianity, must adapt to one another. An old wineskin is reconditioned by means of rubbing oil into it for its own refreshing. Word there's kainos, meaning to be refreshed or renewed. Can you say that again? Messianic and Jewish faith must what? Be Judaism and Messianic faith. Messianic faith, Christianity. Judaism and Messianic faith must adapt to one another. In other words, in, in one way of putting it, Jacob must become Israel again, and Edom must become Esau again. Edom here representing Edom from the first century onward, was that's what Christianity was called by Jews. And so Edom must become Esau again. Esau means it's done. And Israel means God will rule. Jacob... You know, not a real nice name, perhaps. But the, you know, Jacob must become Israel again. Edom must become Esau again. And those two recognizing that they're twins would be really, really nice once again. We worship the same God. We have the same stuff. We just don't recognize it because we've been ignoring each other since Constantine told us to do so. But anyway... 
carrying on. Um, oh, you just proved that words mean something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so the new Naos patch of Messianic faith then has no need of re refiguring the Messiah. The, the word new here is Naos, which means really actually new. Kainos, the word means for this, what's going to happen to this cloth or this, this thing, is, is, it's going to be refreshed. But if they, don't, if they don't adapt to one another, then there's trouble. If they do adapt to one another, then this messianic faith doesn't have any need for refiguring, doesn't have any need for changing who the Messiah is. You can go ahead and let the Messiah be the Messiah. First century Christianity has no choice but to adapt to Judaism. And this proved it had no choice. And this proved to, to actually be healthy. It's been discovered within the last year, actually. Last year in Israel, it was discovered. Actually, a little after my wife and I were there, there was a discovery and began to really dig into this that Jews and Christians lived, not only lived together, but died together and buried were buried together, even if they were unbelieving Jews. Okay, that's not a matter here because there was no other people to join. And that went on for four centuries. Yes, ma'am. I just have a Michelle question. How does the statement Judaism and Messianic faith must adapt one another uh, relate to one new man? Yeah, that's... Of course, Ephesians here. Ephesians is basically Romans 11 in a longer form. Romans 9 through 11 in a longer form. There's Joe. Oh, there's. She <laughs> drove by herself. Oh, he's Jack's disappointed. Who's it? Jewel. Jewel. She Michelle thought she was. I'll answer your question in a little bit. <laughs> Come here. Jack. Jack, buddy. Come here, Jack. Jack. Come here. Come here. He's so excited. Yeah. Anyway, um, yes, the one new man, and this was spoken of by Paul as a fact of, the, of his day. When Jew and Gentile come together, when Judaism and, and Christianity come together and recognize that they are twins, okay, that is when you have one new man. That is when you have, you know, there's a song, and I'm going to put it on my, on my story probably tonight because it's coming to mind. It says, I love the soldiers and hate the war. I love all the soldiers, both Jews and Gentiles. I hate the war. And that's a rather deep statement, actually. And so to, for us to someday, someday we will put aside the things that we think are so different, and they're really not that different. They really aren't. And I'm saying both sides need to do this. Someday we'll put the, our so-called differences aside and we will see where each side needs one another. And there will be, again, one new man, just like there was in the first four centuries. Yeah. I hate, I love the man, but I hate the sin. It's, yeah. it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I love humans, but I hate what, what they do. What, yeah, I hate the war mm -hmm. that we create. I hate the sin that we create. You don't hate the player, hate the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, something like that. But, uh, so, first century Christianity had no choice but to adapt to Judaism as this proved to be actually healthy. Very recent discoveries in Eretz Yisrael prove that traditional Jews, Jewish followers of Yeshua, and former Goyim, former pagans, all worshipped together in unity for there was no other context in which to worship the Lord. That is, they were somewhat forced to make it work. And I say somewhat forced, I mean, yeah, you could go home and read a Bible you didn't know anything about as a pagan, former pagan, by the way. 
Back then they understood it, it was a Jewish book. The Torah scholars and Pharisees, the Torah scholars and Pharisees of the above story could not seem to adapt. I wonder if we were even to be handed the opportunity, could the modern church adapt to Judaism? The Judaism that we were once so well acquainted with. Once upon a time, we were so well acquainted with Judaism because we were in it. Who are we more like within the above story? Father, allow us as modern Christians the opportunity to brace our twin brother. Cause both twin brothers to rightly and honorably know how to adapt to one another in shalom and ahava, agape. Who are we more like in this story? Anyway, so, yes, love humans. Hate the division that we so seem to love sometimes. And hate what sin does to the person. Love humans, all of them. Okay? All right. And we're working toward agape love. Ahava. So let's end there, and I, I want to pray. And thank you for letting me go this far. I covered a chapter tonight. So, Avinu Shabbat Shemayim. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this hour, this hour and 10 minutes, for this time of looking into your holy word, looking into your, your eternal word, all of it from cover to cover. And it is eternal. And thank you for allowing us the opportunity to discuss it through because, yes, I can preach a topical sermon, but, you know, we all must take this in, and there are sometimes I just don't feel quite worthy to be the only one talking, to be the the uh, Nico the the uh, the Nico laity, <laughs> yeah, the Nico the one ruler over the laity. So, Father, thank you for this opportunity to discuss this and go through it to maybe understand it better and apply it to our lives. I ask again that you would uh, entrust you to give us a good Shabbat, to give us a good break, a good stop, a good ceasing from the everyday hassles of life and allow us to find some peace of mind again. And uh, thank you again for Brian and his family. Uh, give them, Father, even in the midst of this time, as they mourn and as they attend this funeral, uh, give them peace of mind and peace of heart. May their spirits be whole. And for all of those others that we've prayed about in the world around right now that is struggling with, well, frankly, insanity, struggling with panic and so forth, help us to find our peace in you and may we as believers understand that the world might just have an ear to hear right now. Shem Yeshua in Jesus' name. Amen.